Look in your life at what it is that makes you more conscious rather than less conscious. Rather than running away or deluding yourself, what brings you face to face with life and wakes you up and cultivate that. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. Focusing on the Eightfold Path which is a teaching that the Buddha gave in the very first uh, afternoon of his teaching when he met his old uh, friends who he'd been practicing with in the forest before he went off alone to, to seek his last, the last stage of his practice of enlightenment. And when he met them, he taught a combination of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path as being the heart or the essence of the way of awakening. And in the previous weeks, we talked first one talk about right understanding and understanding our inner potential to develop a much greater capacity for love, for compassion, and for wisdom. And that it follows certain laws, the laws of karma, and our actions create what happens with us. And then in the next second week, we spoke about right attitude, right aspiration, and the kind of thoughts of open-mindedness and uh, renunciation, willingness to look at or work with our experience as a way to discovery of freedom and practice. And then the third week was the beginning of the section of the Eightfold Path on virtue, right speech. We talked a lot that night about using speech as a way to become mindful or conscious or aware, and to be helpful and truthful with it. The next step of the Eightfold Path we want to speak of tonight is entitled Right Action. And right action is traditionally taught as the major aspect of the precepts. Its fundamental quality is ahimsa in Sanskrit, or non-harming. It's acting in such a way that we don't harm other beings. Gandhi said to come to the heart of consciousness or of truth, one must, must be able to love the meanest creature as oneself. And those who think that religion has nothing to do with politics do not know what religion really means. That to live in this world of a complicated society, a political, economic, social reality, a major part of our spiritual practice is how we relate to the other people and all the other beings around us. Non-harming. It sounds so simple. And yet we look at the world around us and there are between 40 and 50 wars currently on the planet. There are 60, approximately 60 countries or more that Amnesty International lists as places where people are tortured and put in prison for their views, religious, political, social views. And even in countries where that doesn't happen so much and there isn't war, there's a lot of harm being inflicted from one person or one being to another. So we need to begin to inquire, why does this harm happen? Why do we hurt people when we do it? Have you ever hurt anyone in your life in some fashion or other? Perhaps there's no one in the room who could not think of some instance. Why do we do it? Have we ever looked? If we want to become conscious and learn the meaning of ahimsa or harmlessness, let's see if we can figure out why we harm. For some people, 
if you look or you inquire very deeply, you see that in the moments that you would hurt someone else through your actions or your words, that you're in pain. If you really look at it, that a lot of the source, maybe not all, and I don't want to explain it completely, but to to just say some things for you to look into. Do we ever hurt people when we're not really in pain ourselves? And then the pain that we have generates fear. We're afraid of more pain or we're afraid of some pain we experienced in the past. We're afraid of the pain of hunger or the pain of loss or the pain of denial or the pain of some other kind of thing. And so our fear gets generated. And then out of our fear comes aggression. And it can be the aggression of hatred or the aggression of greed, of grasping, to try and keep us safe, to get what we need so we won't have to experience pain. So we look at our hearts and we see that within us, if anybody really meditates deeply, is rage and fear and greed and cruelty. Has anyone meditated for a long time and not seen cruelty? in themselves, that capacity to be cruel. And also is love and joy and tenderness and compassion and all of the virtues of of Jesus and the great bodhisattvas. It's all in there. But one part, we're talking about non-harming now. One part is that we see that we have aggression and hatred and greed, and it comes from our fear, and that's generated from pain, our actions to harm. And what's the root of that? What's the root of all of that? Maybe the root is a very simple thing, deep but very simple. The sense of me, of mine, of I, of separateness. I have this, I want this, I want to keep it, this body, this sensation, this feeling, this way of being. And out of that comes fear, or out of that comes identification, pain, then fear. So if we want to learn about right action and harming, we need to look at this sense of self, of I, and we need to look at our own pain. We need to see how we separate ourselves. Who in your world Do you consider we? And who do you consider them? Are the Russians them? Are the Republicans them? Are the Democrats them? Are women them? Are men them? Are poor people them? Are rich people them? Are angry people them? Are spiritual people us? Or non-spiritual people us? Because wherever there's that sense of us and them, this is like an extension of I, me, mine. It's now we, us, ours. And them, and they're different. And then it becomes possible to harm. From the Tibetan Lama Kalu Rinpoche, you live in the illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality but you do not know this. You are that reality. When you understand this, you will see that you are nothing. And being nothing, you are everything. That is all. Very simple teaching. Very profound and deep. So the basis for virtue, for right action, is both mystical in that it comes truly non-harming, comes out of a sense of our connectedness with one another and with all of life. And it's also practical. It's mystical and practical, and it ties those levels of our experience together. The Buddha taught the path to happiness through body, through speech, through the heart, through the mind, all together. And the tools he gave were those of virtue, of learning how to speak and act kindly and wisely, of generosity, of learning how to give and love, so we'll be happier. 
Virtue makes us happier. Acting honestly and, and truly and non-harming makes us happy. Generosity makes us happy. And then meditation, calming of the mind and opening of the heart. All of these parts of the path bring a certain joy, a certain strength to our practice. Go forth, O monks, he said, for the gain of the many, for the welfare of many, in compassion for the world, for the good, the gain, and welfare of all beings. Proclaim, O monks, the glorious Dharma and preach a life of holiness, perfect and pure. The instructions he gave the people who understood his teachings. For householders, which is what we are as a group, our main practice is virtue. You could say our main practice is awareness, but the main teachings are working with virtue, which means working with how we act in the world, since we're not renunciates, how we speak and act with one another. To learn to be grounded in ahimsa, or non-harming. To discover the uprightness of heart and action. There's a real strength that comes to it. And in the Dhammapada, the very first verses of the Buddha, it said, One person on the battlefield conquers an army of a thousand men. Another conquers themselves, and they are the greater. Conquer yourself, not others. Discipline yourself and learn true freedom. There's not only a sense of joy that comes from living an honest and straightforward life, but there's a power to it. Power is wonderful if it's used properly. There's a strength and a power to living honestly. Now, the the element of right action or virtue has really two parts to it. One is the non-harming, which we'll call restraint. And the other is the positive side, not that of restraining oneself, but of caring or acting, which we'd call compassion or love. And in, in the shortest talk the Buddha ever gave, someone said, give me the gist of your teachings real simply. He said, fine. Refrain from that which is unskillful or that which harms. Do good and purify your heart. That's it. The teaching of the heart and the training of it is to begin to learn how to care for all that we do in our world. My teacher, Ajahn Chah, loved to talk about virtue. He would give talks to the villagers week after week about it. You'd think, God, he'd get bored. Doesn't he want to talk about nirvana or enlightenment or the Abhidharma or all the different mental states? Nope. He loved virtue. He loved virtue the way people love trees or air or, or their loved ones. He just thought it was the most marvelous, wonderful thing. And it is, actually. It's fantastic. And it's not talked about in our culture. We forget it. It's in the Ten Commandments, and it's in the churches. If we kept the first commandment, or one of the, one of the commandments, not to kill, maybe not even the Buddhist precept of not killing any life, but just half a precept, not to kill people, what an amazingly different world it would be. Could you imagine a world in which people didn't kill each other? It sounds such a horrible thing. I mean, we're not going to go and murder somebody, right? But yet what a transformed planet would be for just half a precept. He loved them because they're so wonderful. They have the power to transform us. All right, let's look at them one at a time for a bit. The traditional precepts. The first one is not to kill. This is the restraint side of it. It means non-hatred, not acting on our aversion, not to kill people, not to kill animals, not even to kill little things if we can avoid it. Someone says, well, what does that mean to avoid it? You have to figure that out. But it means to live lightly on the earth, to take care with all the life around us. 
hospital. And I've talked in many retreats, use that cartoon from the New Yorker of the two deer on the hillside and the hunters down below. And the deer are talking to one another and say, why don't they thin their own goddamn herds? You know? <laughs> it's not a problem with the deer as far as I can tell in this world. And there are too many somethings maybe, but it's not deer. You know, and we get all these excuses and these concepts about it. To not harm, to not kill. First, we have to look at our mind state. Can you kill without there being some aversion? Even little things, even insects. There's hatred. I don't like it. Look, let's get rid of it. Psst. You know, raid or whatever it is. Okay. That's the, that's the little bit of it. But the principle of it is beginning to connect and care for life. And see that it's interconnected, that it's not separate. To refrain from killing means you have to look at your mind states. If you're about to kill even a little thing, look and see if there's an alternative. Or look and see if there isn't aversion or hatred. Even just a little bit of it. It's only a small thing, so it doesn't take a lot. Begin to study your heart and your mind and see what it means to really take care with your action. So that's one side, not to kill. The other side is a cultivation. The negative is not to, to, is to refrain. The positive is the cultivation of care and reverence for all life, of seeing the interconnectedness. We need insects. We need sea creatures. We need krill, which are those little tiny shrimp-like things in the uh, ocean near Antarctica by the billions. They feed the other sea creatures, and the sea um, has a whole uh, effect on keeping the air and the, the whole planetary environment workable for all the rest of the beings. We need bees. Without bees, flowers wouldn't be pollinated, and um, all the food that we eat, almost all of it, we couldn't eat, and all the, all the plants and trees and things wouldn't be able to reproduce most of them, and the planet would be denuded. We need earthworms to aerate the soil. I was at a conference once at Menninger Foundation. and There were all these psychologists talking about hooking Tibetan llamas up to electrodes and what they could learn from that and various things, that kind of stuff. And one of the people at the conference was an old Indian uh, medicine man named Mad Bear from the Iroquois tribe in New York, the Iroquois Nation. And he went out he said, it's my turn to speak. I don't want to tell you about experiments. And he said, please come with me. I want to do a prayer. And all these psychiatrists and psychologists and researchers said, a prayer, huh? So we all went out and we held hands in this huge field in Kansas where you look as far as you can and you see nothing, just more fields, you know. It's beautiful. And we held hands in this circle of about 40 people. And he started to chant and then he started this prayer. The prayer lasted for 45 minutes. He said, first, I want to thank the wind, our brothers and sisters in the wind. And he talked about how the wind came and it cleansed the air and it moved the clouds and it gave us fresh, fresh, sweet tasting oxygen and air to breathe. And how beautiful the wind was, how it touched our skin and it made us feel more alive and it made the leaves on the trees move. How it brought rain in due season and took it away when it was finished. And then he thanked the clouds. And he spent five minutes thanking the clouds and just blessing them. And you'd look up and you'd see these clouds and you'd develop this nice relationship with the clouds. And then he thanked the wheat and the growing plants and he thanked the sun and he thanked the earth and he thanked the earthworms. He spent about three minutes on the earthworms. You could feel them under your feet kind of bit when he was done. For all that they did to make our life possible, our life is somehow connected with earthworms. And when he was done, what I realized was that his prayer was the most beautiful mindfulness meditation. We stood out in that field and you felt the wind and you felt the heat of the sun and you, you felt your feet on the earth and the soil. And you couldn't help but see that you're connected. We kind of forget it on 101, you know. <laughs> but we are. 
And out of this sense of connectedness comes naturally a compassion, a caring, an ecology, not because you're supposed to be ecological, but because you don't want to hurt parts of this that you're a part of. You don't want to hurt yourself. You don't want to hurt all the things that contribute to this this planet. It's like the astronauts looking way back from the moon and seeing this tiny little sphere the size of your thumbnail at arm's length that's blue. It's really fragile and it's very small and it has a thin layer of life on it. 8,000 miles of rock and maybe 6 or 12 or 15 feet of life. Just this, It's sort of like this little green layer of algae on the earth. And it's very precious. So the precept of not killing is both not to kill and also to sense, to connect with the life around, with Gaia, with the fact that the earth is alive and we're a part of that movement. Then the next one is to not steal. It's the same thing. It's a restraint, as not killing was a restraint of not harming through hatred. Not stealing is non-greed. There was non-hatred, now there's non-greed. Not coveting or grasping. Don't take what isn't given to you. Have you ever tried it? I mean, have you ever? I mean, we all have. I used to steal a lot when I was young. I stole a lot, even not so young. In high school and college, I thought it was kind of fun to see what I could get away with and stuff. I was just, I was much worse than that, actually. That's nothing, but um, <laughs> it's true. I wasn't a terrible delinquent, but I was a medium del- I was a middle-class delinquent, you know. In some ways, they're worse because they have very little excuse for it. But we all have done it at some time or other, taken that what isn't given, you know, or fudging on this or that. I won't even say what this or that might be. You can. And what does it do to your mind when you do that? It brings complexity and fear and paranoia and worry. That's one of the beauties of virtue. It eliminates fear and paranoia and complexity. And hoarding and wars and all these things happen because we're afraid we don't have enough. Because we make this us and them. So not to steal on one side again, as in non-killing means look at your heart and see what's there in the moment that you might take something that really isn't yours or where you fudge that thing. And see what it'll do to your heart or mind. Not because it's bad. You can do anything you like in this world. But because these are the, the laws of happiness and how they work. And so you will examine it yourself. It also means, again, a positive side of cultivation, to cultivate a sensitivity or responsibility for the resources that we share. Not only to not take that which isn't given, but to see that the world is very limited and there are five billion humans and lots of other animals, and to take care with what we use of the resources. It's limited. I, someone taught me this exercise. I talked about it in the retreat that just happened in Santa Rosa of lying down on the earth at night and looking up into the stars in a nice starry night and then doing one little reversal of it. You lie back there in the grass or something and you let yourself imagine that instead of lying on top of the earth, you're on the bottom and that it's a big magnet that has you stuck against it and you're looking down into space and the stars and it's it's a nice reversal because it gives you a sense of the infinity of the depth of space and all these spheres of things and that somehow by the grace of gravity you are stuck on here and you don't fall off (laughs) and to cultivate a responsibility for this planet that we're that we're attached to and that we're a part of. Imagine that if you walk through town or walk even in your yard and wherever you went as the caretaker, as the gardener, and then you extended it from that place that you love to this, to the Bay Area or the state or the country or the planet, that you are a guardian or a caretaker of your beloved, the earth. What a wonderful way to walk on the earth. It means when you come to something that's in the middle of the road, even if it's not your lane, it's a nice thing to pick it up 
move it aside. Because you care for the earth. Not because you're supposed to, but because it brings joy. Also, this means to cultivate in non-greed, not stealing, dana or giving. And there are three traditional levels of giving. Beggarly giving, where you give some. It's the way to practice, and it's good. If you give anything, it's nice. Because what giving means is you're practicing being free. Since you don't own it anyway, when you die, you give up much more than you could imagine you're going to give up to anything before that. You don't. You're the accountant in the firm. You get to kind of count it for a while, and it's taken away. So beggarly giving, you give reluctantly, yeah. I don't think I'll use this. Well, maybe I should put it in the attic. No, better I should give it to goodwill. And you give it and it feels good. And friendly giving is after you practiced or when it comes into you and you give things that you care about to people as if they're your brothers and sisters. Here, let's share this. And it feels even better. It's wonderful. And kingly or queenly giving is when you, when you so learn to enjoy the happiness of others that you give of your things, of your money, of your love, of your time, of your energy, because it's, it's wonderful. You give your best, and not because you're supposed to, but, but just because it brings such a sense of freedom and joy. The villagers where I lived as a monk understood this, at some times anyway. I used to feel strange because I lived in one little cave forest monastery where they were very poor in the poor in the dry season. There was rice and tree leaves and um, bat meat curry and anything they could get that, that to feed themselves in the dry season. And here I'd go as a rich American because we're all rich by standards of them making $100 a year or something like that. And they'd give me food. And at first I thought, this is really amazing. I can't do this. I can't take their food. And I, I thought about it and talked to people about it and, and realized that for them it was really a privilege. They were saying when you came in the morning with your bowl, we so treasure and value what you represent as a monk or a nun, as a meditator, as someone who's trying to cultivate a purity of heart and awareness, that we want to give of the little bit we have to you to support that because we want it in our world and in our society and in our life. It was really touching. I read you tonight a couple of stories from Tales of a Magic Monastery by, an, by a Trappist monk who's a friend and a wonderful teacher. This is called The Pearl of Great Price. He asked me what I was looking for. Frankly, I said, I'm looking for the pearl of great price. He slipped his hand into his pocket and drew it out and gave it to me. It was just like that. I was dumbfounded. Then I began to protest. You don't want to give it to me. Don't you want to keep it for yourself? But, but. When I kept this up, he said, finally, look, is it better to have the pearl of great price or to give it away? Well, now I have it. I don't tell anyone. From some, there would just be disbelief and ridicule. You, you have the pearl of great price? Ha! Others would be jealous or someone might steal it. Yes, I do have it. But there's that question that keeps coming back. Is it better to have it or to give it away? How long will that question rob me of my joy? <laughs> to not kill, to not steal, which is to say to cultivate reverence for life and a caring and a generosity with all the things that we get them, they go anyway. Have you ever given anything away and for the most part, and regretted it much a while later. You forget you even had it. You do. <laughs> Sexual misconduct is the third precept. Restraint. Again, it's non-greed, non-harming. Don't act in those ways sexually which hurt people. It's very straightforward. Traditionally, it means adultery or incest or, or, or sexuality with minors or things since we don't know who's married anymore in our culture, for the most part, it means that we have to look at our sexual actions and not do it 
where it's going to hurt somebody. It's that simple. It goes from harming to non-harming. And we do it. Why do we do it? Again, looking at why we harm. Out of our own pain, out of our greed, out of our need. When you look, it's out of pain. There's a positive side that can be cultivated to this. Not only not harming, because it's such a powerful force, sexuality. And who in this room has not been an idiot about sexuality at some time in their life? Is there a person who dare speak? (laughs) And who in this room hasn't experienced some hurt by it or some fear about it? It's powerful. That's why there's a precept about it. We can cultivate a positive side, which is that sexuality for householders, not for renunciates or monks or nuns, can be associated on one side with compulsion and grasping and greed and fear. You know that kind. On the other side, as a neutral energy, it can be associated with love, with tenderness, with communion, with intimacy, with a growing consciousness. And so we can begin to use this powerful force to cultivate it as a place of consciousness in our life, of caring, an expression of tenderness. Why is it so powerful? Anybody ever look? It's powerful, you know that, right? Why? Well, one reason is because it's so close to birth and death. Birth comes out of it. Death, they call orgasm in French the petit mort. It's the, the little death. It's, it's powerful because it's close to our biological being, of our incarnation. It's also powerful because of the union or the surrender of it. It's one of the few places in life where there's natural samadhi, where the mind becomes unified, and it's so fantastic. Not all the time, you know how sex is, but sometimes when you stop thinking and and you're there, it's like everything comes together, the body, the heart, the mind, and there's this sense of unity or union. And then there's a transcendence or a going beyond oneself, a surrender of touching something greater than ourself, of losing this prison of I, me, mine, and it's fantastic. And so we crave it then, and we get into, unfortunately, attachment and greed. It's powerful, and for good reason. I'm writing an article on it that hopefully will come out this fall, entitled, Do Gurus Have Normal Sex Lives? <laughs> and it's really about the sexuality of, of gurus and teachers and disciples in many spiritual scenes in the West. I won't talk about it so much tonight, but there's a balance between indulgence on one side. You turn on the TV and it says, indulge, indulge, that will make you happy. You've tried it. It doesn't work that way, you know, because you get it and then it just reinforces your greed. Or on the other side, suppression, repression and condemnation. So that this sexuality can cause pain or can be associated with consciousness and love. And it's so powerful. And then the next precept of the four traditional ones that we'll cover tonight is drugs and intoxicants and alcohol. A different kind of precept. Again, it's restraint side. Non-killing was non-hatred. Not stealing was non-greed. No drugs or intoxicants to excess means non-delusion. Greed, hatred, and delusion, the three roots of our suffering, grasping, aversion, and not seeing clearly. It means don't take intoxicants or drugs or, or alcohol to the point where you become heedless, where you lose your awareness. Awareness is really precious, and it's hard to come by. If any of you have done a retreat, you know how hard it is to even get a few moments of it. It's precious to live in the present moment, to be alive. It doesn't mean don't have a glass of wine or whatever, but it means pay attention. Don't harm yourself or the things around you by indulgence in a way that leads to carelessness or heedlessness or loss of consciousness. That's the negative side. The positive side is that instead of that, we can find ways to cultivate 
the seeds of greater awareness or sensitivity. Look in your life at what it is that makes you more conscious rather than less conscious. Rather than, rather than running away or deluding yourself, what brings you face to face with life and wakes you up? And cultivate that. So this quality of virtue, I spoke of it mostly in terms of the precepts, because they're the fundamental principles, but you can extrapolate it as you like. It means restraint of our greed, hatred, and delusion, not harming beings and not taking that which isn't ours and taking care with our sexual and our, our intoxicant life. That's one side. And it means cultivating the opposite of greed, hatred, and delusion, which is love and generosity and consciousness. The opposite of greed is generosity. The opposite of hatred is love. The opposite of delusion is awareness. They're called training precepts in Sanskrit. I undertake the training precept of not killing. I'll try it. I'll work with it. I undertake the training precept of not harming. And if you learn to do this, if you train with them, they'll teach you a tremendous amount about your, your own mind and your own heart, if you look at them. They'll provide a great power in your life. There's almost no power like the power of someone who's virtuous. It's like a rock to stand on in the winds of this kind of end of the Roman Empire <laughs> society that it feels like we live in at times. It's a rock, and it's a wonderful one. It's a really beautiful place to rest. So there's the virtue of the training precepts of restraint and cultivation, and then that leads to inner strength or power. And then the third level that it leads to is called Adi Sila, or the highest virtue. And what this is, is natural virtue. You train with it, you practice with it, you get a sense of its strength and why you would harm and how that works and what it means to live in an upright way where you don't harm. And gradually that understanding seeps into the mind and the heart until it becomes your way of being. And then you don't think, I'm not going to harm or I won't hurt or I'll do this or I'll take care with that. But you feel connected with life and the world through wisdom, through the clear seeing that we are not separate. We are not separate. We are not an individual. It's a ruse. It's a play of consciousness. It's a fiction. There comes a natural virtue where you take care of the planet and the people around you and the creatures and the animals like it was your garden. What a wonderful way to relate to it. And you know, our hearts are good. Even though there's plenty of greed, hatred, and delusion in there, their basic root is goodness, is love. Maybe that's what we're made of, is love. But we forget to look and we forget to ask. So we get caught up in a whirlwind of busyness in our lives and we break the precepts. Or we get caught up in a whirlwind of habit. You know? So the exercise for this week, each week we've been working with a different exercise is to look when you might break a precept in the tiniest way of harming a creature or not taking care with with the planet around or or taking that which isn't fudging it, what isn't really yours, or with your sexuality or intoxicants or other things like it. And look and see what's there under it. You might see greed or hatred or fear. And then look to see if there's pain. Look to see if there's pain in you that you're trying to get away from by doing something else. This is the true meaning of the greatness of heart, which is what spiritual practice teaches and demands of us. A heart which can open even to that pain, which it doesn't say, as the TV show on Marin County did, I want it all now, and acts out of greed and hatred and delusion, but which recognizes I am it all now, that it's all a part of me. And so instead of grasping, it settles and opens and says, pain is a part of me and pleasure and all of life is a part of me. And I can feel pain and I can feel joy and love and compassion and hurt 
And if you can open to that in your heart, you never need to break a precept. So study it this week and look at when it might happen and if there's pain. And if you open your heart in that way, there comes a silent kind of awareness, a real tenderness that's a bridge to our connectedness with all of life around us. And so I read you a last story, again from the tales of a magic monastery. A visit from the Buddha, it's called. Why did I visit the magic monastery? Well, I'm a monk myself, and the strangest thing happened in my monastery. We had a visit from the Buddha. We prepared for it and gave him a very warm, though solemn, welcome. He stayed overnight, but he slipped away very early in the morning. When the monks woke up, they found graffiti all over the cloister walls. Imagine, and do you know what he wrote? One word, trivia, 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 all over our monastery walls. Well, we were in a rage. But then when I quieted down, I looked about and realized, yep, it's true. So much of what I saw was trivia, and most of what I heard. But what's worse, when I close my eyes, all inside was trivia. For several weeks, this was my experience, and my very efforts to rectify it just made it worse. I left my monastery and headed for the magic monastery. The brother showed me around. First, the hall of laughter. Everything fed the flame of laughter, big things and small, sacred, solemn, inconsequential. Only laughter there. What a wonderful room. Next, the room of sorrow, the very essence of bitter tears, those of the bereaved mother, the lonely, the depressed. Only sorrow here. Now the hall of words, words upon words, spoken and written alone. They must have had some sense, but altogether, total confusion, words, words. I cried out, stop, stop. But I was only adding words to words. Next, the great hall of silence. Here there is no space and no time. He took me finally to the hall of treasures. Take anything you want, he whispered. I chose the heart of Jesus. And with that, I am heading back to my own monastery. Thank you. the heart of Jesus or the heart of the Buddha or our own hearts to awaken the root, the foundation of our practice is this non-harming, is learning to see inside and to connect ourselves with life. Thank you.